Frank and I are both uh, uh, large sheep operators here in the state of Idaho, and uh, we've experienced the ups and the downs of the industry, and a uh, big factor in the downs are the imports. That's why we're here today, and uh, they're uh, ruining the domestic sheep industry. If we don't get a handle on this, we're done in time, and not that much time, because we can't hold on at these marginal prices. This year, they're better, but uh, they're affected much by imports. Yeah, it's still just about break even, and uh, as soon as they get it up a little bit, then they'll bring more imports. The small industry, they'll get our lambs, they won't move them, they'll back them up a little bit, and then they'll steal them. And uh, that'll take about a year to work its way out of it. Like a year ago, we'd had a good market the year before, and uh, in November, they begging for heavy lambs. And they didn't have any, and they the kill was cut down, and then they got some during this year, and they said, "Oh, we got too many," and boy, we couldn't even we couldn't even sell those these good Idaho mountain lambs. In uh, August, when they went to market, we sent them to feedlots in Colorado and just feeding the feed costs are, you know, how they have been the last couple of years. It was terrible, and I, my lambs just about we just well about it gave them away up here. I mean. That's just the way it might maybe have been better off. And it just, it just it's what, 73 to 77% right now is foreign lamb. And they just take more and more. And these range outfits, they're gone. They're gone. And they're not going to come back. And him and I, you know, there's, uh, uh, it's not just us. Heck, we can walk away. But we do love this industry. And we'd like to, and then they do these, this country a lot of good. This is my range right here. And I don't even get the sheep down in there anymore. I used to have sheep right there on that hill, but uh, so many people and dogs and everything, I just, we keep them up higher and then we climb out of here pretty fast. But this this is a big, big deal out here. Someday a fire will start in here and all them trails and people scattered up through here. And it's the same way all over the Western United States. They need those sheep. And the doggone, you sit right down here, you go into Albertsons, I can't sell my lambs. You go into Costco, in Winko now, they were carrying American lamb, and it's not all their fault because it, we're getting to be a smaller industry too, And and uh, but it needs to be a quota or something. But yeah, it's right there in stores, you see it, and my lambs right here can't even sell them the best lambs in the world. They're second best or full. Well, they're, they're, <laughs> all, they're, they're very good lambs. Yeah. Break yeah, in. Henry, can you talk a little bit about like more specifically, like what are you? I'm not looking for financial secrets here, but like we're break even right now for you guys, and where's the price at, and how how is that historically? Because you have your ups and downs in ag. Oh yeah, but right now yeah. it's like particularly bad. Kind of where you're at like, financially. Well, break even is varies um, outfit to outfit, of course, but uh, at uh, at the last year to buck thirty five, buck forty lambs, uh, some were getting less than that. Uh, that doesn't cut it. That doesn't cut it. We've got to get probably a minimum of a, like a buck eighty, dollar eighty a pound. To yeah, that's uh, at, at minimum. That's probably minimum. Yeah, and uh, but last year, like yeah, mo most of my lambs come out of the feedlot, and I we got twelve. I got a twelve dollar freight bill getting them there, and they was bringing about dollar twenty, you know. And c then we got them up there and couldn't get them dead, and we had to put them on a hay. They feed them hay for a while and to slow start, their so to they slow wouldn't gain, but hay cost just as much and they didn't gain on it. I mean, and there was no call for that. They kept this lamb meat price high in the store, and the and then they brought imports in to fill in a little bit until we got that little bit over supply and bang. So you're well under the cost of production right now. Not now, no. Right we're, now we're, 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 just, we're we're yeah. above it a little. We're above yeah. it. Okay. No, but last year it was under. It was a bad year, and plus all of our years. costs were so high: our hay, the corn, the truck, and the fuel, everything. All of our expense, the groceries for our herders, uh, everything. The wages, uh, you know, uh, everything was elevated, and our returns, our revenues were down. What's the solution? Solution is going to be, I think, some form of a uh, whether it be a quota. Or if we, uh, which I don't think we could ever have this, but it would be great. They did at one time have an agreement with Australia, New Zealand, and the United States not to inundate our market. But that's basically, they're not honoring that. And I don't think it's affected anymore. It's like you said, it's up to 75% and it was like 50%. 
what? 75% is, 74% for 1% is uh, imported lamb into this country, of which 75% of that is Australian, and it's duty free. They come in here with no tariff, any restrictions whatsoever. Well, the American dollar, when that's 65 cents to our dollar, I mean, they bring it in here and they sell it that much cheaper and we can't compete with it. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I like to think I'm a heck of a good sheep man and I know this guy right here is a heck of a good sheep man. But, and we get, we get production per you as good as I think you can do, but we can't, we can't do it. And it's a, and there's nobody, you know, I, I got one nephew, he'd love to have this outfit and I, I'd let him have it, but I don't want to put him through it. There's so much and all the other stuff we go through and everything else and we need to be paid for it and those and those imports coming in here that's just it's just not right yeah and are the sheep imports so high recently because of an increased demand for meat or simply because the packers can get it cheaper from overseas and get it cheaper overseas with the cheaper. dollar the dollar lamb is becoming uh, more popular uh as we go along, they're under, they're realizing that it's a really excellent meat, and uh, but uh, whenever whenever we get it rolling, you might say for us, here they come. They're smart. They're good marketers. And my hell almighty, uh, for a dollar U.S., it's a buck seventy in exchange, roughly buck fifty to a buck seventy. It varies with the exchange rate, but it's it's like going to Vegas and winning every hand. Yeah, it's quite lucrative. The exchange rate is why it's so much cheaper to bring it in from Australia. That is part of it. Yeah, yeah, that's a big factor. And they don't have restrictions like we have in this country. In this restrictions, well, first of all, uh, restrictions are qualifications that make it easier for them to produce it. We have, uh, we have to, uh, more regulations with our help. We use sheep herders, the H2A program, which has been wonderful, wonderful for us, wonderful for the the men that we use, it provides them uh, a good income and uh, they better their families in Peru or Mexico or wherever. But uh, uh, it's, uh, they, in Australia, they don't, uh, they don't have the predation, predators like we do here, right here. Frank had sheep piled up right up here with wolves. We had deer on that point above the capital last year that killed 142 head, I believe it was. And, and they, they can use a toxicant uh, it's called 1080. They, it was here in the United States until about 1973. And then it was taken out with, because of the overlap of its, uh, it would kill several you know, different species. And that certainly isn't popular with the public. And uh, we had that control, but in Australia, they don't. So they, they've got advantages. They don't need labor like we have, but our lambs are truthfully, they're superior in taste and quality because they're raised on these wonderful ranges in the West. And then ours are further processed just a bit in a feedlot until they reach a certain specific weight. And then, and then they're uh, slaughtered from there. And that's what hurt us here last year because they couldn't get them killed. And uh, consequently, they got heavier and heavier and heavier and they become more uh, fatty, less desirable for the consumer. And uh, they were, like Frank said, they were, then they start feeding them a hay ration, which is just a maintenance to keep them from gaining. And that, that does hurt the quality of the product. And it hurts our bottom line because it's extremely expensive and we're having them custom fed. And don't get us wrong. I mean, they need the foreign lamb in here now to, because of the supply. But it needs to be, uh, we got both got a good friend. He went over there years ago and he said, you guys don't need to do this to us. There's room for us all here. And they says, oh, we just care about that market share. And they get it all, then you look out. Because when these, the ethnic groups will eat the small groups of lambs in the country. They'll, they'll eat them, and they like to eat the small lambs and bless them, all this different, different things. But these range outfits, when they're gone, now you look down in California, you look down there, that fire's burning up down there, and a lot of it's because they won't harvest that timber. But they've, they've run those sheep men out. They've made it so tough on those sheep men. And they got it paying the sheep herder overtime down there. He's sleeping out here on these ridges, and uh, he sleeps more than, I mean, he, 
the guy in the morning, he, he pushes his sheep, he gives them the direction, they go off the, down the hill, they drink water, and they take a nap from 10 o'clock till 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and he takes a nap, and he gets, you know, and the, but the, it's the, the red gun, those guys, but anyway, they just made it so tough on those guys and those fires. I mean, that's a lot of the cause of running those. There should be a lot of sheep in California, and they're just getting less and less. There are not going to be any down there pretty quick, very few. The way they're going. What about here in Idaho? How has the industry changed over the last five, ten years? It's um, little by little going down. Yeah, little by little. Yeah, is it's, there uh, anything our governor, or congressional de delegation, could do? Yeah, what do you, what is your what do you want people to do? Like, the, the, you want can you synopsize what you're asking them to do? It? Yeah, also, we've we've what already legislation would do. We yeah. have we've contacted the uh, um, trade commission. Uh, ambassador, uh, we've uh, notified or uh, uh, contacted our uh, congressional delegation. I spoke with the governor myself, as did Frank, last week. Uh, he was very receptive, and he's at, I don't know if he's there now, at the Western Governors Conference. I don't think it's starting until next week. Anyway, he's going there, and he said he would talk in, uh, with other governors from the West, and we spoke with other sheep operators from other states, and... Uh, they are also aware of this, their governors, to, for them to contact their governors and to carry the message and to try to get something like that political, because that's what it's about. But the thing is, you know, the guys that call the shots, they're not too sympathetic to us because we're, we're, we're a small industry. But when we're gone, we're gone. And people will miss us because we provide a lot of services. You might say we use the services. We buy uh, a lot of uh, supplies, fuel. We use the truckers. Uh, we buy the hay from the farmers, the grain, pastures. Well, look at it. Yeah, the, the pasture. We pasture these alfalfa fields off in the fall. You know, there might be that much growth. There might be that much growth. They spread that fertilizer all over the field and the rodents in there. And these farmers, they love to have those sheep in there. These out, you know, guys. That's right. And uh, one guy, he, he don't ever spray. He's got three or 400 acres of alfalfa. Never has to spray them because those sheep every fall come in there and they, people say, do you have, get bugs? Did you get the bugs? And they're all the weevil. And, nah, I got sheep. But uh, no, they're very, they're, they got, the sheep's got so many useful that I don't think we even touched the bottom of what they can be used for. But, and they're wonderful meat and but it's terrible when these lambs sitting right here and can't get them dead, but they ship them clear around the world. A product that won't even start. They're not to touch fresh it. from imported lamb. Is they claim it's fresh, but it's been slaughtered a month, thirty days sooner. But they, the, the meat packing industry is uh, sophisticated enough to where they can vacuum pack these and they chill them at a certain temperature and they bring them here just barely. They may even not even freeze them, but they'll have them like thirty-two and a half degrees or something. So they just barely under f being frozen. We could, if we could just get along like a, uh, a trade-off, because like Frank says, there aren't enough domestic lambs in this country to su supply the, the demand. However, we, w w they, they, the way they infiltrate our, our, our niche, our, our prices, they come in and they'll chase it down, they'll go offer, well, they, they play the game, the purveyors, like I mentioned earlier. They'll say, uh, uh, or we can get it for this much less. Uh, I think we'll quit you guys. So what do they do? They got they got to keep that blood on the floor, so to speak. That's something kind of crude, but that's the name of the game in a packing business. And the smaller our industry gets, the worse it is. The infrastructure just keeps going away, and it's harder to fill that that uh, niche there that we need to do. And and then they was killing what thirty years ago. Hundred the the saying was that they killed. 100,000 lambs or less a week, they could hold the market. Now they're killing 31, 32,000. They can't have them work it. That's domestic. Yeah. Yeah. Domestic, there's uh, uh, between 1,500 and 2,700 tons of lamb brought in a week into the United States. Not a month, not a year, a week. That's a lot. They're like sometimes 300% of domestic production at times. It varies like from 190 to 350% of our domestic production, our domestic slaughter per week. 
So what's the bottom line? Well, we, we know what we have to do, whether we can get there. Uh, that's it. Uh, Buy Idaho lamb? That's right. Buy Idaho lamb. I'm going to that store. Ask him, how come, we're, how come you don't at least have the Idaho lamb here with you? I'd rather eat Idaho lamb because you there's a big difference in it. And uh, you guys have any other questions? I have what, one quick thing. Can you really quickly just talk just a little bit about the, 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 the history of sheep in Idaho? It's got a rich history, right? Oh, you Your bet. families are both oh. embedded in that. How? Well, right here, this was once Brad Little, our governor's grandfather, who was the sheep king, Andy Little, right here, Emmett, back at Emmett, he had 100,000 head. And prior to him, there were other, they, they, there was an influx of Scotch, Scottish people that came. And then after that, they employed Basque sheep herders. And the Basque sheep herders uh, figured out they could branch off and do their own thing. And that's kind of how I, I'm in this deal. My dad came here in 1929 from the uh, Basque country. And uh, I'll bet you 70% of the sheepmen, West Range sheepmen in America are uh, descendants of sheep herders that come in here. Wouldn't you say in there? Oh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. That were sheep herders well, come in here on Come in the West and, and in Idaho yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Back when the bad time, you know, back in the World Wars, wool was high and because they're feeding the soldiers. And like some people say, if we, we might be speaking German, it wasn't with American sheep man back then and then they had all these extra sheep and you know the sheep and the sheep are going the price went to the bottom a lot of those sheep herders you know a sheep herder he saves his money because he's got everything and they bought sheep they go back then there the taylor grazing went in and they get some range and they went and bought a sheep and there and they was in business you guys talk a little bit about moving forward what the sheep industry means to your family and and what the loss of that would mean to your family like frank you mentioned you have a Nephew could be interested in taking over, but you don't necessarily want to hand off all the hardship. Yeah, I mean, these sheep mean a lot to my family. I mean, it's not as old as my dad. Uh, I had sheep. I bought my first sheep when I had a little boy. And all that. I don't have, I never got married, never had kids. Should have, but I didn't. And uh, I was married to this sheep outfit. And I worked, I mean, I, to the last four or five years as some operations and stuff, you know, I worked harder than any man I had. And I, and, uh, and I just went and they were say, you know, I saved my money and put it all back in this outfit and just kept, and Brad, I had a stringer outfit over there in Oregon, I got it. And then Brad Little, he'd come over and buy bucks from me. And he said, I'm gonna sell you that outfit. I said, no, you're not. And, and uh, the sheep price was terrible. and. And he shot me a deal, and I got gone. I I bought the outfit, and I called up my dad. I didn't want to even tell my dad. I said, Dad, you know, Brad shot me a good deal on that outfit. Well, yeah, yeah. And, I, and then I finally said, and I bought it. And he says, well, that sounds like a good enough deal, but what the hell would you want it for? <laughs> but, uh. Yeah, no, it means, like, you know, it's in our blood. You know, every time we drive by, a, whether you got one sheep in the field or ten, we all, they, we always take a look, I know. Yeah. And with me, I've got, I don't have any sons. My daughters are here. I have two daughters that live in this area, one right here in North Boise and the other, my other daughter in Star. I have grandkids, but this is, uh, uh, they've got their lives, and uh, it's uh, quite a transition if they were to, they were raised around it. But, and my one daughter helps me, Dominique helps me a, a lot on my shippings and that. However, uh, it's a, I have to say, it's a hell of a nice outfit in Eastern Idaho. It's all put together. It took a lot of years to do it. And I would hope that it would be profitable enough for someone to want to undertake it or take part of it and another, somebody else take another part of it. But uh, if we don't get this import deal straightened out and get this price where it's stable, it might be adios. Yeah, I honestly think if that market would have been this year like last year, they you would lost what half of these <laughs> oh, outfits. Oh yeah. I think they just walked away, settled it. So and just it, wanted to suggest um, either one of Henry's daughters would be willing to say a few words if you guys would like to get a comment from them. 
um, it's about how hard it is for them to listen to this. I'm also curious, real quickly. You said something needs to change in the in the near future. What are we talking here? Are we talking weeks, months? Like, how quickly do you guys need something to change before there's drastic consequences? Well, yeah, you tell me how fast politics, how po political stuff changes. It, it takes forever. It's, but it's about like a glacier, you know. But uh, it, it's not going to change within a year. But I think they could get some legislation or something to to not necessarily legislation, but some kind of regulation to uh, offset the influx of so many imports, so many tons of lamb. That would really help. That'd bolster the market. It, it'd show those guys in, that are moving the lamb back east. It's mainly back east, back in uh, New Jersey and Philadelphia area and New York City in that east. That's where their big consumption is. Uh, it would show those guys that uh, they just can't hold that over our heads. Like, oh gosh, we'll go to those imports. Well, maybe those imports aren't quite as available and they've got to respect us. We're not wanting to uh, screw them over. We just need to have yeah, what need, is fair. Yeah. Yep. You want an even playing field. Absolutely. And it's not right now. From an exchange rate point of view, that's what makes it so lucrative. And uh, they're just, they can, they can dump it in there. They can produce it cheaper than we can. And you guys aren't getting any sympathy, so to say, from the domestic beet packers. They're they're doing the best they can. The packers are doing the best they can. But see, they got to sell that meat to the next guy. They got to sell it to the purveyor, the guy that is the jobber, the guy that knocks on the door of the the restaurant or the grocery stores and uh, the big chains back east, the, the Kroger's and the uh, yeah. you know the the Wal WalMarts and that. Yeah, but it's they're not being nice to you. No, they don't have any sympathy for you. <laughs> That's obvious. I mean, you know, Idaho number of sheep yeah. producers has gone down while the imports have gone up. Yeah. And that's the story. The graphs in your press release show that. And it's just tragic. It is. It's right there. Like he said, it's on a graph. It shows that those graphs aren't lying. They're, they're not skewed. With Congress, can just leave it at that. With Congress being how it is. <laughs> Um, if nothing was able to get done at the national level, what's the next best thing? Is there something the state could do to help you guys out? Or is it really a national trade issue? Well, the state, I think the governors and, and that trying to get the others to help and maybe hold something over their head, get them all demanding this. But uh, other than that, if they don't do something, I, I mean, I just... Uh, they got it. We, we've both been back in, we've been to D.C. and we sat there and everybody, boy, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Then we can, we'll help you in this last year about it. They don't want to, they don't want to be in with Australia and New Zealand. You know, what was in the, yesterday they talked on the, they just sold them so many missiles and all that. Big deal. It's little sheep herders. But they're sacrificing. What I want to know, why has another country got the right to come in here and ruin an industry? Because they're going to ruin this industry. I mean, they've already about ruined it, but they're going to ruin it. We need to take care of our own. We understand what the situation is. We don't produce enough to meet the needs of the country. However, we we need to be able to sustain our operations with a superior, a better product. And that's, that's all. Uh, I think the nation owes it to us, protection. I mean, you know, I don't expect them to be there with naval ships, sinking barges, bringing lamb over here. However, uh, I think they need to protect their domestic producers. We're the guys that pay the taxes and property taxes, uh, and taxes on our income and, and whatnot, you know. And uh, those guys, like I said, they come in here duty free. But that's the way we do it. Over the years, in the last 30 years, I think I probably bought out, one time we knew how many, close to 40 sheep outfits. And I bought them, you know, when sheep were cheap, and you know, everybody would go sell them Frank. You know, I'd keep <laughs> on them going. And, uh, and I bought them when they was real cheap. But I, I think it close to 40 outfits that I bought them clear out, and they're gone. I got the ranges of the Highland and the Stringer outfits. And, uh, but uh, the rest of it, it's gone. Of those 40, how many are getting out of, because of the reasons you're talking about right now? Probably, uh, I would say, one of them was my own brother that lost because of the bighorn 
all that propaganda on the bighorn sheep, which was all, yeah, they, it was, that was what was not right. And those ranges now are, that's a different deal, but they're all grown up with the brush and the bighorns aren't coming back. We didn't make them, but I probably 35 of them, I would say, got out because of that. What's the forecast for next year? Optimistic, not so optimistic? There's no lambs right now. It should be great, but we can't count. Do I want to go out and buy high dollar replacements this year and next year can't sell the lambs? It, uh, use, we're getting, it don't take long. You know, you don't they get older every year. They're, you know, those use, there's a big loss. There's a, a lot of things can happen to them. If you keep them good, which you got to keep your ewes young and good to produce. You get, we, uh, but, uh, and that's what, like last year, they, when they did that to us, it just took another year out of the sheep industry because the people there, there were nobody wanting. And if it had been 20 years ago, I'd have probably been buying last year when they got so cheap, I'd have been buying lambs, a bit you lambs and going. But no, I was so mad all last year that I didn't do it. We were scared last year. We really yeah. were been in this a long time and it looked pretty, pretty grim. That's why we kind of started this effort, Frank and I conversing. Uh, how much longer can we stand this? And we thought, by damn, we better do something about this. So uh, we got the ball, we so to speak, got the ball rolling on this import issue. That's how this got started. And then the RCAF petition comes out. Oh, the RCAF, yeah, well, because, yeah, yeah. Totally that was very yeah, they excellent. They did a good job. They did a heck of a job. job in that. They did, yeah. Do you guys want to talk to Henrik, one of Henry's daughters, to get a, a thought from them? Dominic? Come on. <laughs> Dominic. She's a good hand. I see tears coming out of her eyes over there. Yeah, she should be running this out, probably run both of our outfits. Yeah, I'm probably so. <laughs> I've seen her in action. She's kind of good. She's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, right by your daddy, right? Come here, Nick. Come here between, yeah, the, the old saying of the rose through between two thorns. <laughs> <There>. <laughs> and what was your name for us? My name is Dominique Echeverry. Okay. Do you need me to spell that? If you would, yeah. yes. Yeah, D-O-M-I-N-I-Q-U-E-E-T-C-H-E-V-E-R-R-Y. All right. Glasses up. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not too bright. <laughs> Did you ever think you'd be standing here no. hearing your dad okay. saying what he's saying this morning? Um, no. I think, you know, growing up in this, you hear about the ups and the downs. Um, but I see the, the true seriousness of this. Um, I have great respect. Yeah, here I do get emotional. <laughs> uh, for the sheep industry and these two men. And, um, and they're, they're so sincere in this effort. Um, and I think that if they're saying it's dire, it's real, you know, because being in agriculture, it is like you have to be the hardiest person ever because you're you're dealing with mother nature and the government and it's really um you're dealing with so many factors so you have to be so resilient and optimistic and i've seen that um especially growing up <laughs> with my dad but to know that this is you know th this is real um and hopefully i you know it goes beyond the local level i hope at the national level there's recognition of um yeah let's let's balance this out And we don't want to kill the Australian, New Zealand no, sheepmen. No, no. And, and, they, and I think maybe it would help it, really. I think maybe it would help them. And it is interesting. Like, I remember when I was part of some different um, organizations within the sheep industry. I mean, there are conversations. And overall, you want to spread the idea of eat lamb. Um, but it does. I think it's just, you know, they would want it to be fair on their end if it were a reverse situation. So it seems very reasonable. Um, but it's about livelihoods. When you look back at the Wood Hills, what do you think of in terms of working with sheep? For me, it's funny, I've been trained well, because when I look at any foothills, I often think about the sheep feed, <laughs> and I learned that from him. Um, but yeah, I would say certainly I look at it as um, just how beautiful it is and how lucky we are um, as feed, but also as fuel. And it can be good fuel or it can be dangerous fuel. And it is a true story. Sheep truly serve a benefit of, um, you know, helping um, manage that. And um, I was actually telling Frank a story that I was mountain biking up here a couple of years ago. 
I'm a, you know, it's cheesy, but I see his herd of sheep and I'm just in heaven because it's a beautiful sight and them, oh, oh gosh. Yeah, he's been, he's been my buddy for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. But just seeing the sheep, you know, very lightly moving, moving through and the herder and, and it's, um, it's a, it's a really pure, you know, it's, it's a pure way of making a livelihood.